Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Denise Battles, and I'm very privileged to serve as SUNY Geneseo's lucky number 13th president. I'm delighted to join you as we celebrate Open Education Week. This important event unites people from around the world to celebrate the value of free and open sharing in education and the associated benefits for both teachers and learners. Here at, June, at SUNY Geneseo, we have the following entities and people to thank for being part of this international celebration. They include the SUNY Provost Office and the SUNY Office of Library and Information Services. I'd also like to extend my sincere thanks to Paul Schacht, my colleague, uh, as well as the Open Education Resources team in Milne Library for making this event possible. And those individuals include Ben Rollins, Alexis Clifton, and Amanda Wentworth. Over the course of this week, our community has had, or will have, the privilege of hearing from some of the nation's key voices in open education. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of those leaders this evening. A man who has been called by the New Yorker, quote, the most important thinker on intellectual property in the internet era, end quote, Lawrence Lessig. Professor Lessig is the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School. He also taught at Stanford Law School, where he founded the Center for Internet and Society, as well as, as, well as at the University of Chicago. Professor Lessig is a founding member of Creative Commons, a global nonprofit organization that enables sharing and reuse of creativity and knowledge through the provision of free legal tools. He also serves on the scientific board of AXA Research Fund and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences as well as the American Philosophical Association. Professor Lessig's current work addresses institutional corruption, relationships which, while legal, weaken, weaken, pub weaken public trust in an institution, especially as that affects democracy. His books include Fidelity and Constraint, which is forthcoming in 2019, America Compromised, 2018, Republic Lost, 2015 and 2011, and Remix, Making Art and Commerce Thrive in the Hybrid Economy, 2008. It is my distinct honor to present our Open Education Week keynote speaker, Professor Lawrence Lessig. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Madam President. It has such a wonderful ring to it, Madam President. Um, I'm a little embarrassed because I walked in and I saw the poster had me wearing basically exactly what I'm wearing tonight. And <laughs> I, I just want you to know that I actually have two white shirts and I do wash this vest every once in a while. It's not my costume, it just happens to be so tonight. Okay, I'm really honored and happy to be here to celebrate this Open Education Week at a university or at a system, New York uh, uh, SUNY system, which has embraced the ideals of open education so fundamentally. Um, and to reflect on issues that I've been working on for more than two decades, and I hope to offer some new thoughts. But I want to start with some stories. And there will be three stories. And here's the first. <clears throat> Whose woods these are, I think I know, his house is in the village, though he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake ask if there's some mistake, the only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. 
Those words by Robert Frost are words that last year I would not have been permitted to utter to you in a speech in public like this. But as of January, 20, January 1st, 2019, those words became free to our culture. They were first copyrighted in 1923, but this year they passed into the public domain in 2019. And that is a wonderful fact that it took way too long to happen. Indeed, there's an extraordinary range of work that passed into the public domain this year for the first time that work has passed into the public domain for 20 years. In 1923, the copyright law gave authors such as Robert Frost a 28-year term so that it was protected until 1951. And then if in 1951, it was renewed, he got another 28-year term, meaning it would have been protected until 1979. Then in 1979, Congress had effected an extension of the copyright term so that it extended until 1998. And then in 1998, Congress again granted a 20-year extension to copyright terms, meaning it was protected until 2018. Why? Well, what do you mean, why? You have to ask which part of the story there are you asking about? Well, we can ask why first about the term extension. The extending of copyright terms for existing copyrights. That's what I mean by term extension. Why precisely that? Because we all understand copyright is a right. It is an exclusive right. We could call it a monopoly right, but it's not polite to call it a monopoly right among at least IP scholars. They don't like to think of it like a monopoly. So let's say it's a right, a property right, which of course itself is a monopoly right. But again, it's not polite to talk about copyright as if it's a monopoly right. So let's just say it's a right, a right that is given in exchange for something new. It is a right in exchange for a quid pro quo, a gift in exchange for a gift. Congress says, in effect, go forth and create, and we shall give you copyright in exchange. And my view is this is a good idea. It is a wonderful idea. Because what that system does is enable creators like Frost or George Gershwin or Virginia Woolf or Margaret Atwood or even Charlie Chaplin to be able to create and to make their creativity available broadly. Not just to be rich, although that's good too, but more importantly, to be able to be independent of patrons. The core innovation of copyright was to make it so creators didn't depend upon someone else when they created. They could afford to create, and because of that affordance, therefore, there is more creativity in our culture. That is a great and wonderful but here's the puzzle. Why is any of that greatness true for extending a copyright? How is there more made after the thing has been made simply by extending the term of copyright? Because if copyright is an incentive, the one thing we know about incentives is that incentives are prospective. They are about creating an incentive now for someone to do something in the future. Not even the United States Congress could get Charlie Chaplin to do anything more. It is counter to logic, but of course logic doesn't constrain this institution. This institution honoring this great American, the Sonny Bono, in 1998 enacted the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, which extended the term for existing copyrights, logic notwithstanding. Now, when we challenged this statute, we asked a bunch of economists to join a brief to help the court explain exactly why this was not logical. And we got this left-wing, oh, wait, I'm sorry, this is Milton Friedman, right-wing libertarian <laughs> economist to join the brief 
but he said he would only join the brief if the word no-brainer was somewhere in the brief. So obvious was it that you could not advance the public good by extending the term of an existing copyright. But apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress unanimously extended the term of existing copyrights. What there was was more than six million dollars in contributions from the Disney Corporation and related companies making the core incentive of copyright not the incentive to the creators. Now you could look at that and you could say, so what? We didn't get more, but did we get less? Did it do any harm other than just making it so some rich copyright owners could be rich? And the answer is yes, we got less. Extraordinary work building on work that Paul Heald has done, mapping the availability of work as a function of when it was published. These are books in the Amazon warehouse by decade. So what this says is, until the 1910s, the availability is growing up, going up substantially, and then just at the point the copyright was still in place, mid-1923, uh, you begin to have this black hole of accessibility. Work that is no longer accessible because the cost of clearing the rights are so great and the shift and the focus of availability is availability of works that have very high commercial interest. So hope parts of our culture get hidden by this black hole. And it's not just that they get hidden temporarily. Some parts of our culture, film, for example, or recordings, which are so delicate that by the time the copyright expires, they will not exist anymore. This is the consequence of perpetual extending of existing copyrights, and that is the black hole of culture that we should recognize it affects. Okay, that's story number one. Here's story number two. So it just turns out <clears throat> that we don't eat very well. I mean, we eat lots of food, but lots of what we eat is not very good. And there's many scholars, but I love this book most, Michael Moss's book, Salt, Sugar, and Fat, that begins to describe quite powerfully the way food is designed that way. The way the processed food industry has developed food science and food science is the objective to find the elixir in this mix between sat, salt, fat, and sugar that would produce the addiction so that people can't resist the food that's being sold and then they therefore don't resist it. The story of American food consumption, not just America, but we are the canary in the coal mine, is the increasing shift to processed food and processed food increasingly shifting our nutrition out of balance. Now what's so striking about that book is the story it tells in a number of parts of executives in these companies who get it. You can think of them as the kind of enlightened executives who begin to recognize just how much harm their companies are doing. How much damage is being done to people and their bodies because of the food they are selling. And those enlightened executives then begin to push the companies to produce healthy processed food. They begin to push different mixes that would be better food for people, especially children, to eat. Less poison and more real food. They try and vigorously, in some cases, Kraft and the Coca-Cola company being the most extraordinary in these stories. And then the market reacts. And the stock market has a very clear reaction to this innovation. And very quickly, the enlightened within these companies get elevated out of the companies, and the companies go back to their old ways. Now why? Is it because these are evil companies filled with evil people? No. It's because these are companies living within a highly competitive market. And what competition teaches generally is if you snooze, you lose. But more importantly, if you try to lecture your customers, you lose. What we'll sell is what we want. 
And if one company doesn't provide it, we'll switch to what another company does provide. What we want, us. And so it's not going to be them, the companies that fix it. And it won't be the government that fixes it. If there's a fix to this, it's a fix that comes from us. We must choose if progress is to be made here individually, every single day as we make choices about what food we will eat. That's story two. Here's story three. So I learned this story about the timing of the passing of this poem into the public domain 20 years ago from an extraordinary man, Eric Eldred. Eric Eldred ran an online press where he made public domain works available, mainly because he saw his daughter didn't have much interest in these works, and he thought he could make them available in a way that she would find compelling. Eldred was an activist. And when Congress extended the terms of existing copyrights, Eldred, the copyright activist, decided that he would publish despite the threats of the law. And I went to Eric and I said, look, this is a dangerous strategy. Let us instead challenge the Sonny Bono Act. And we took that challenge to the United States Supreme Court. And as you know, I lost in that case. But in the course of that challenge, Eric Eldred said to me, look, I know you're not going to win in the Supreme Court. You're standing against all the money in the world. But we want, I want something more to come out of this case than just a defeat in the Supreme Court. I want you to promise that if you lose, you will start a foundation devoted to the public domain. Now, of course, being young and convinced of my own genius, I didn't think I would lose, so it was an easy promise for me to make. And I made it openly and willingly, but the consequence of losing was that a group of us started an organization called Creative Commons. And when we started Creative Commons, we thought there was an obvious intervention in the current debate around copyright. The world was divided between those who believed all rights should be reserved and those who treated copyright as something where no rights would be respected. And we thought there was a space, conceptual space at least, between these extremes, where an author could say some rights reserved. I'm happy that you take my work and share it or build upon my work, but if you use it in these ways, I want you to ask permission first. And by populating the world with a series of licenses that made it relatively simple for people to assert the freedoms they intended to give and those, they intended, those rights they intended to keep, we gave authors a way to say free, a way for creators to say free and therefore a space between these extremes and a way to practice in that space as artists and designers and photographers and filmmakers and musicians and academics and citizens found a way to exercise the rights of copyright outside of these two simple extremes. Now, the copyright activist in this space is one who takes this practice and leverages it to a different understanding. And there are many activists, but I want to spend some time talking about one. And that activist is a boy named Aaron Swartz, who I met at a very young age. He was a young genius technologist at the time. Eventually, he would contribute to the founding of Reddit. But at the time I met Aaron, Aaron's focus was on making information available to the world to make the world a better place. Aaron traveled to Washington in 2002 to watch the Eldred argument. Here he is being interviewed at that. So uh, who are you and why are you here at the Eldred argument? Doesn't make sense. I am Aaron Swartz and I'm here to listen to the Eldred, to see the Eldred argument. Why did you fly out here from Chicago and come all this way to see the Eldred argument? That's a more difficult question. See the Eldred. 
because I, like, I don't know. It's very exciting to see the Supreme Court, especially such a prestigious case as this one. Shortly after that, I talked to Aaron about the idea of Creative Commons and hired him to be the chief technology officer at Creative Commons. Because he had already marked himself in the metadata universe as one of the key innovators around metadata. He had helped craft the RSS protocol, which at the time was the dominant way to spread syndicated material on the web. And so Aaron was present at the moment we launched Creative Commons. Now that you've seen the theory behind Creative Commons, it's time to show you some of the practice. So when you come to, your, come to our website here, and you go to choose license, it gives you this list of options. And after he helped us launch that project, he moved on to the Open Library Project. He moved on to help with the Public Resources Project. And then he became focused more directly on questions of social and political reform as he helped found groups that I was participating in as well as ones that I did not. And in 2010, he came to Harvard to be a fellow at the Ethics Center that I had just led as uh, started a project around institutional corruption to lead. Now, in 2010, Aaron had moved beyond the questions of copyright. And he had begun to focus his work on more progressive politics generally. And then he describes how he was pulled back into a copyright fight. So for me, it all started with a phone call. It was September. Not last year, but the year before that, September 2010. And I got a phone call from my friend Peter. Aaron, he said, there's an amazing bill that you have to take a look at. Well, what is it, I said. It's called COICA, the Combating Online Infringement and Counterfeiting Act. Oh, Peter, I said, I don't care about copyright law. Maybe you're right, maybe Hollywood is right, but either way, what's the big deal? I'm not going to waste my life fighting over a little issue like copyright, healthcare, financial reform, those are the issues that I work on. Not something obscure like copyright law. So you can imagine him having this feeling, maybe best evoked by this. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. And he spread this experience to me. He sent me this email and he said, any idea of Lofgren, that's Congresswoman Lofgren, I would be willing to take a stand against Koika. And I, too, had felt like I'd moved beyond copyright, and I had an equivalent kind of... Every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. So I responded, what is Koika? Is that a virus? And he said, well, that's close enough. The Internet censorship bill. Now, what Koika was was an extraordinary statute that would make it possible for the Attorney General to bring an action against a domain name and to shut down that domain name on the internet when it was alleged there was copyright infringing material on that website. And what Aaron began to organize was a movement to stop that bill. And his organization, Demand Progress, started spreading information. And quite astonishingly, though the bill passed the Judiciary Committee, it was never voted on in the floor because of the movement that he had helped start to stop that bill. Now, that itself was a pretty incredible victory because Hollywood was pretty powerful on Capitol Hill. But shortly after that defeat, like Jason in Friday the 13th, this idea came back. And it came back in a form that's more well known. It's a bill called SOPA or PIPA. And it too was a bill that would enable law enforcement to take down websites based on the allegation that there was a copyright infringing material on that website. And when Aaron stepped into this fight, the fight to stop SOPA and PIPA, what he recognized was this as an impossible fight to win. Because at the moment they took up that fight, there were more than two thirds of the Senate who had signed a letter saying they would support the SOPA and PIPA bill, and a majority of the House had already voted to. So the majority of Congress was already committed to this bill. But they organized the most incredible grassroots organization in the history of internet organizing to date, 
and they were able to build a movement that climaxed with websites shutting down their website to protest this fight. Here's Aaron reflecting on that. And that was moment. when as hard as it was for me to believe, after all this, we had won. The thing that everyone said was impossible, that some of the biggest companies in the world had written off as kind of a pipe dream, had happened. We did it. We won. And then we started rubbing it in. <laughs> you all know what happened next. Wikipedia went black. Reddit went black. Craigslist went black. The phone lines on Capitol Hill flat out melted. Members of Congress started rushing to issue statements, retracting their support for the bill that they were promoting just a couple days ago. It was just ridiculous. I mean, th there's a chart from the time that captures it pretty well. It says something like, January 14th on one side, and it has this big, long list of names supporting the bill, and then just a few lonely people opposing it. And then on the other side, it says January 15th, and now it's totally reversed. Everyone is opposing it, just a few lonely names still hanging on in support. This was a victory that was completely unexpected and startled Washington because it had no sense it was going to happen. Indeed, Chris Dodd, who had been the senator from Connecticut, and as senator promised he would never become a lobbyist after leaving the Senate, and after he left the Senate, promptly became the chief lobbyist for the Motion Picture Association of America, had become the chief lobbyist with the promise that he could deliver SOPA and PIPA because he was so close to the leaders in the Senate. And when they stopped it, Washington for the first time had a clear sense of the potential of this platform to be used to organize not just remixes and Twitter fights, but political action. And this victory was not just a victory about copyright, because the people involved in this fight began to understand that this was a fight that was necessary because of the incredible inequality in political power that had grown up inside of Washington because of a kind of corruption, the kind of corruption that would bring a crazy idea like a t term extension act to unanimous passage in Congress, a corruption in the very way our democracy functions. Now this issue of corruption was an issue that Aaron had brought to me. In 2006, I was a fellow in Berlin finishing my, what would turn out to be last book about copyright, the book Remix. And Aaron came to visit because he was coming to a conference that was held in Berlin every year at Christmas. And I was eager to tell him about my new book and talk about this TED talk I was going to give about the oppressive regulation of creativity through copyright. And he was a little unimpressed. And after bantering back and forth, he finally said to me, so how do you ever, how do you think you are ever going to solve the problems you're challenging? Sensible IP policy, sensible internet policy. So long as there is this deep corruption in the way our political system works. I was a little miffed that he was not more excited about what I was doing. So I pushed back on his question. I said, you know, Aaron, it's not my field. And he said, you mean as an academic? I said, yeah, as an academic, it's not my field. I do internet policy, I do, I do intellectual property policy. He said, okay, but what about as a citizen? Is it your field as a citizen? And this was who Aaron was. His question could hug you like a parent hugs a child. And I knew from that moment that I had a choice. I could either be the person I wanted to believe I was, someone who did what he thought he should do because it's right, or I could be the person who did what would be easy and rewarding because I had been so successful at it to date. And I couldn't look in his eyes and get any forgiveness from him 
for doing the easy. And so that night, he and I decided, it's insane to think about this, but he and I decided that night that I would give up the work I was doing on copyright. That summer I announced it was finished. I was resigning from the leadership of the International Commons Project and Creative Commons. I would take a st step to the side. I moved to Stanford. Uh, I mean, I moved from Stanford to Harvard to start a center that would focus on this issue of corruption. He joined me in this project. This boy had a power over so many people's lives in exactly this way. He wound us up and sent us off in our own directions according to the master plan he had to bring America to a different justice. Now, his focus at this time was on the question of scholarship, the access to scholarship that people had given the institutions that had developed in the context of the internet. And his particular ire was drawn by the organization JSTOR. Now JSTOR is founded in 1995 through an incredible grant from the Mellon Foundation. When it was founded, it was huge by internet standards of the time. Close to 1,300 journals, 38 million pages of content covering every single subject from the beginning of the life of a journal to the present. And when it was launched, I remember us all thinking this was incredibly brilliant because there was access now that was extraordinary to content that was inaccessible to most across at least the country. But at the time Aaron was focused on JSTOR, it was becoming increasingly criticized. There's a tweet from Carl Malaman. JSTOR is so morally offensive. $20 for a six-page article unless you happen to work at a fancy school. And what this tweet focused on was an increasing recognition of what access actually meant. So for example, I was reading an article in the Harvard Gazette about a new professor um, and the economics department. And she described in this article, um, explaining why there were no books on herself, she said, everything I need is on the internet now. So let's just take that sentence. What exactly does that mean? But consider an example. Let's say you're interested, as I am, in corruption. You go to Google Scholar and you type in campaign finance to get the most cited articles about corruption. There they are, the list of the most cited articles. And so I start clicking through those articles. So the first one, properly, maybe the most prominent of these articles, 29.95 to get access through Heinlein to this article. Well, here's the second one through JSTOR in terms that are not quite clear. Third one, once again, you have to purchase access through Heinlein. The fourth one gives you um, a free trial for one day, but then you've got to buy a membership plan for up to $100. The fifth one, JSTOR, un unclear terms. The sixth one, JSTOR. The seventh one, JSTOR. Eighth one, JSTOR. The ninth one, JSTOR. The tenth one, once again, you can pay access through Heinlein. So when we add these 10 together and ask the question, how accessible is this information to those who don't happen to live at the Harvard Law School, it is free for one of these 10 articles, at least one time only. For one of them, you had to pay $10. For three of them, you had to pay $29.95. For five, the terms were unknown because they were at JSTOR. And so when she says everything is on the internet now, what precisely does she mean? She means if, and this is a very big if, you are a tenured professor at an elite university, or maybe just a, pro a professor at an elite university, or maybe students and professors at an elite university, or maybe students and professors at a US university, if you are one of the knowledge elites, then you have free access. But the rest of the world, not so much. Now there's a name for this, it's a technical legal name. It is outrageous. Here's Hillary Clinton uttering this idea, it's outrageous. It's outrageous because we built this world. We academics built this world. This reality flows from the deployment of copyright. But here, this is copyright to benefit the publishers. It's not to enable authors. 
there is not one of the authors on this list who gets any money from those copyright restrictions. Not one of them who wants the distribution of their articles limited. Not one of them who has a business model which depends upon restriction of access to their academic work. Not one of them should support this system as knowledge policy for the creators of this creative work. It is crazy that this is the reality we have allowed to evolve. Now this fact really troubled Aaron. Aaron attended a conference in Budapest where the question was asked, how much would it cost to get JSTOR to make all of their resources available to the developing world for free? And the answer was given that it would cost $250 million to buy access from JSTOR to give it to the developing world for free. And that claim drove Aaron and his colleagues nuts because this is work which the creators don't get any money for, which is intended to be accessible universally, but which is blocked because of the business model of those who happen to have been assigned to the copyrights associated with that work. And that fury started him down a dangerous path. Here he is at a lecture. Everything up to now, all of those journals, all that scientific legacy going back to the Enlightenment that's still behind locked gates. But you, you have a key to those gates. And with a little bit of shell script magic, you can get those journal articles. You can download copies of them. And once you have a copy, theoretically, you could make it available to everyone. And if you don't know how to make it available to everyone without getting caught, you can go to gorillaopenaccess.com and find my mailing address. And hard drives that get sent there will find their way online. And it's not just describing, it was also practicing. The year Aaron was at Harvard, he spent some time at MIT. In particular, he spent time in Building 16 of MIT in a basement room in Building 16 at MIT. The government, in an indictment later, said that he broke into a restricted computer wiring closet at MIT. He broke in by opening the door. It was unlocked. It said that he accessed MIT's network without authorization. MIT famously prides itself on being a location where free access to the internet is available to anybody who's on the premises. He conducted, connected to JSTOR's archive of digitized journal articles, and using this access, downloaded a major portion of JSTOR's archive and avoided JSTOR and MIT's efforts to prevent this copying and to elude detection and identification. That much is true. There he is, eluding identification and detection. Needless to say, he was caught and then arrested and then charged. In an indictment and in a superseding indictment, he was charged with unauthorized access. The US attorney held a press conference and bragged that she was going to bring charges and convict Aaron and send him to jail for up to 35 years in prison. Now, of course, MIT had this open access policy and a later analysis by MIT's internal uh, uh, academics um, said that as a guest at MIT, it seems possible that he was actually authorized to be using the network. So that means that there is no criminal wrong at all. So that gave hope to the defense of this prosecution against Aaron, and indeed his lawyer was optimistic that he would defeat the prosecution. But two years into the prosecution, having expended all of the money he had saved to defend himself 
and looking forward to a life that took away the freedom that he had depended on to be the activist he had become, Aaron was not optimistic. And on January 11th, 2013, he hanged himself in his apartment in New York and triggered an extraordinary outburst of emotion across the internet as those who had known and loved and been wound up by this boy realized that we had lost. About four months after this, there was an investigation into the question of this $250 million claim. It turned out it was a typo. It wasn't true. This whole effort had been launched on the basis of a misunderstanding. For a fraction of this, JSTOR would and was making this material available freely to as much of the developing world as they were permitted to through their licenses. Okay, that's the third story. And from these stories, I want to draw three lessons. So the first is a lesson about scholars. We scholars get a copyright, but it's a copyright made for others. It's made for others, but applied to us. It's a system of regulation intended for photographers and filmmakers and musicians and authors of books. But it's applied to those of us doing research and journal articles and academic monographs, spreading knowledge, not fiction. And the consequence of taking this device developed for them and applying it to us is very predictable in the digital age. This is a graph that maps the increase in serial expenditures, percentage increase over the prices in 1986. That's the top blue line. And the second blue line is the consumer price index. What this graph is saying is that those who control access to these academic works are increasing the cost of access more quickly than the consumer price index is going up using technology whose own inflation prices are going down. The technology is getting cheaper, but the prices are going up. And this is because of the dynamics of a market in digital technology and the concentration of the forces that are deploying resources in this market. It is a natural and obvious result of concentrated holdings of copyright. And that dynamic has no relation to the purpose of ours. Right? This is just completely office, obvious, right? It is no purpose of ours as scholars that access to scholarly material be more expensive in a moment when technology should make it less and less expensive. And we can't let their business model defeat our business model as creators. Because our business model is the model of the enlightenment. Our business model is universal access to knowledge. And by that, I do not mean a plug for Google. OK, that's lesson one. Here's lesson two. Paralleled off of the salt, fat, and sugar allegory. Only we can fix this. And by we, I mean we individually and we collectively. Because we individually, as scholars, can choose free when we make our work accessible. And we should understand it as an ethical rule that we choose free. Or at least CC free. 
where you make it accessible under terms that at least assure that it can be copied and distributed freely around the world. This should be a rule for scholars. Because if we make free the work that we make accessible, then we will encourage many ways for many different entities to make it possible to find and share and enable access to this work. And most importantly, among those entities, the extraordinary ecology of libraries around the world. Each of the works that we produce is a brick, a brick that could be in the only wall we should celebrate, the wall which celebrates the knowledge that we collectively are producing. Because our job, we should understand, our job as scholars is not just the job of finding truth, our job as scholars is also the job to guarantee access to truth. It is just as important that we find out what's so as it is that we find a way to convey to others what is so. And that means not just the ability to teach, but also the freedom to spread and share what we know. That access is within our power because the copyright that controls access is ours. And it is within our power to choose to make the work accessible in a way that others can take and build upon. That's lesson two. And here's lesson three, a lesson drawn from the activists, the third allegory. All of us, must become activists in this fight. Students are activists when they ask their professors, why have you made this work available so that only Americans at rich universities have access to it? Why have you done that? Why was that your choice? What is the ethical principle that leads you to make your work inaccessible to the third world of on this planet? What is the choice you have made? And how do you justify it? That is a role for students, and they could do it brilliantly. And it would take just four or five questions in a university before professors everywhere would clean their acts up. Second, universities should be activists. Universities that lead here, and again, I think the SUNY system has been one of these systems of universities. But just this last week, we saw an incredible step taken by the University of California as it canceled subscriptions with Reed Elsevier, with Elsevier's services because it couldn't assure access to the materials that it wanted to provide openly accessible in terms that were made sense. And by California taking that step, it made it possible for others to take that step as well and it would only take three or four more before the business model of exclusive access no longer made sense. And finally, organizations need to be activists. Organizations that aid in this project. And the one that I helped start with Eric Elger at Creative Commons has been playing this role for the past decade and a half. First, by providing certificates that help people understand the dynamics of open access to educational material. Secondly, by building a platform for open educational material and bringing people into a conversation about enabling the spread everywhere around the world. And third, taking a lead in the, in the push inside of our own government to get our government to fund the supply of open access material. This education department is spending $4 billion to support the development of open access textbooks. This activism is incredibly powerful, but it is more powerful than is obvious. So why is it so powerful? Think again about our friend Mickey Mouse. Why did Mickey not return in 2018? Why didn't Congress extend the term of copyright again? And the answer to that question is, there is a public domain again today 
not because anything the courts did, and not because anything that Congress did. There is a public domain today because of the extraordinary number of people across this country who have built an understanding that resists the idea of ever increasing proprietary control over our culture. And what the Disneys knew is that the fight they would have if they took this again as their cause was a fight that they probably would win because that's the nature of our corrupted political system, but it certainly would not be worth it to them because the cost to them and their brands from being this yet again grabber of the public domain would be much greater than the return from assuring access to this tiny fraction of work that continues to have any commercial salience. And this is the point. All that matters in this fight ultimately is us. It might not matter much given the corruption of our political system, but it is the only way that we can matter. It's not sufficient in many fights, but it is necessary. And if sufficiently deployed, then this is the real power that we have. This is the chance to rally every single part of this who is not them, this, us, who is not the government and is not those who would benefit, profit from taking this culture, to rally us to make it so obvious to everyone that what they are doing is against what we as Americans in our tradition should defend. And in that strategy, I can think of no greater wisdom than these words from J.K. Rowling, and I got permission from her to use this because she's a very active copyright defender here. It was important, Dumbledore said, to fight and fight again and keep fighting, for only then could evil be kept at bay, though never quite eradicated. That is the third and most important lesson here. Okay, I'm going to end with just one more reflection. So as mentioned, the final book I wrote was a book called Remix. After I wrote this book, and I was speaking about it, there was an incredible example of remix that was spreading all across the internet. And the example was drawn from a remix between this incredible film, John Hughes' at The Breakfast Club from 1985. This is the modern Brat Pack. Um, and this music by Phoenix, Mr. Mania. So somebody asked, what happens if you mix these two things together? And they produced this incredible video. I was trying to make in this book was that the internet was encouraging this kind of call and response culture where someone would produce and that would inspire others to produce in response. So after this video came out, San Francisco, uh, Brooklyn made this remix of it. San Francisco had to get in on the mix. So sentimental, not sentimental, no. And then there were literally scores of these that began to explode all across YouTube from Amsterdam, you know, like cousins. You know, from Winnipeg all across the It was all in response that was the creativity I tried to celebrate in Remix. Now, as I was speaking about this, my, record, my lectures were being recorded, and some of them were posted on the internet. And late in the arc of this, I got a letter from the lawyers of Listomania, representing Phoenix 
for the song was Dominion. And what the lawyer said was I was violating their copyright. This was a kind of make my day moment. Like, <laughs> I was violating their copyright by using their copyrighted material to describe and explain how copyrighted material was being remixed consistent with the ideas of fair use. And they demanded I take my videos down off the internet. That did that. So I contacted my friends at EFF, and my friends at EFF filed a lawsuit against these company. And very quickly, run away, run away, run away. Away. and there was a complete victory, and EFF got some money out of this to help them fight in the other cases like this. Now, of course, not all people have the EFF next to them to defend their freedom to at least comment about copyright policy in America. Litter YouTube is littered with channels that have been shut down because of threats, because of copyright alleged offenses, many of these just as baseless as the ones that I experienced. And the dynamic here is that, you know, while we can win and move on to other causes, they, the copyright interests, never move on. But despite that, despite the resistance, the reality here is that this is the right side of history. This understanding is where we are going. And I was never more sure of that than in the last six months. You may have seen a version of these videos that appeared across the net and is one that I had used in my talks. It led me to understand why this person was so familiar. So this is Boston University's version. And so this is the reality of where we are. Maybe the most compelling member of the Democratic Party, if indeed she is a member of the Democratic Party, has not just understood, but she has lived the practice, the freedom that this movement celebrates. This is generation obvious. It's obvious to this generation. And I think in 20 years, when people look back at the struggle we're having right now, they would say, huh, what, how is that possible? What was the issue? What were you even arguing about? And when that happens, that will be wonderful too, but it will have taken way too long. That's a hopeful future. But that future is far from where we are here. Because where we are here is still in these dark forests. These woods are dark and deep, lovely though they may be. But now this is in the public domain, I can remix it a bit, here we go. <clears throat> but we all have promises to keep and miles to go before we all will sleep. Miles to go before we sleep. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>